I, uh, I was really uh, very hardworking and very fortunate. And when those two things came together, uh, I was admitted to Harvard Medical School and uh, did my medical school there. And it was, boy, was it really hard and a lot of fun. And uh, I followed my medical school training with uh, a residency in family medicine. And I thought for sure I was going to be a family doctor. But I discovered how much I enjoyed uh, working in the emergency room. And in America, if you make a graph that shows how exciting people think emergency rooms are and how exciting they think family practice is, people think emergency rooms are a lot more exciting. I mean, whoever saw a TV show, family practice. <laughs> so I started off my career in emergency medicine, and I was pretty happy with it until I was given an invitation to come and work in a nursing home. And you can bet you'd know the answer of what I, how I answered that invitation to take a job in a nursing home when I was a big shot ER doctor. No. Well, you know, destiny had other plans. And I did take a job working in a nursing home. And here's the thing I didn't count on. I fell in love. And I fell in love with the elders. And I fell in love with the people who care for the elders. And I gave up my career in emergency medicine and went to work taking care of elders. Now, there's something you should know about me. When I finished my residency, I didn't move to the city, I moved to the country. And I bought a little piece of land and I pitched a tent on that little piece of land, and the first thing I built was an outhouse, <laughs> which, trust me, is the first thing you should build on a piece of land. So I uh, built an outhouse, and um, my wife and I had uh, one little baby, and we lived in a tent, and we built a little house uh, all by hand. And uh, we had a rain barrel, and no electricity, and some milk goats, and a garden. And I was very happy uh, living in my little house on top of the hill. And it, it happened um, one day when I was at work. I took care of a man who uh, uh, was very old and who was under my care as he passed away. And uh, uh, maybe a month or so later, I was driving on a back road, and I saw a beautiful pair of uh, Belgian draft horses. And where we live, Belgians are the most popular uh, breed of draft horse. Anyway, so I stopped the car, and I go to the farm, because I'm just interested, and you know, you can do that. And the fella I'm talking to, we're talking horses for a little bit, and then he goes, you're Dr. Thomas, aren't you? I'm like, yeah. You took care of my dad when he was dying. And he said, is there anything I can do to repay you? And I said, yeah, you can teach me to drive those horses. So I started coming over to his place, and I started uh, taking lessons from him. And here's the first thing uh, we used to do. I'd come over and we'd muck out the barn, and he had a ho horse-drawn ground drive um, uh, manure spreader. New idea, if you know the, you know the one. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> we'd muck out the stalls, and then we'd go out to um, spread. 
And <clears throat> as we were kind of going down the lane, he'd give me the lines. And <clears throat> the horses, who had been going perfectly straight down the line, now started going this way and this way and this way. And then I'd give him back the lines and they would go straight again. And <clears throat> I watched him and he didn't do anything. He just sat there like this. But when I drove the horses, they were all over the place. And this was a really important lesson for me that getting better and better at something means being able to do less and less. There's a real art, a real skill that comes in being able to mm, make something that's difficult look easy. But we'll come back to that later. So I eventually learned how to drive well enough to get a pair uh, uh, of horses. Um, uh, the first pair I got, <laughs> again, uh, there's horse, there are some horse people in the audience, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> the first pair that I bought were a pair of Percheron, coal black Percheron geldings. And uh, they were a handful, let me tell you. Uh, these really nice, mellow horses that I'd been working with over on this other farm. Wow! These horses were like all ready to go. And uh, I kind of picked up from that that living things aren't like machines. You don't just get the model number and say, yeah, I'll take that horse in black. And they are living, breathing creatures and as such, uh, are entirely different from each other. And how often we forget that when it comes to aging, when we begin to think about all older people being the same, or all older people having the same problems or the same characteristics. Well, uh, over the years I actually got a, a lot better, I can say, at, uh, uh, being a Teamster. And uh, as the farm grew, we hayed with the horses, we uh, logged with the horses, we ran a maple syrup operation, 400 taps, um, and we started, uh, our, uh, we kind of gave up on the goats and started buying calves at auction. And uh, we kept, we only, we milked about six cows a day, but we fed calves, got them onto pasture raised them to be, um, and bred them back, and sold bagging heifers. If you're in, is it much dairy out here? Not so much. So the dairy farmers are always looking for bagging heifers because they're gonna get the calf and a milker within a few weeks of when they buy the cow, so, or the heifer. So anyway, uh, and so we were running this operation, and at the same time, I was trying to teach people about uh, the Eden alternative in the greenhouse, like, uh, and I was trying to help people understand things. And one of the things I discovered is that I could use the horses to help people understand things that they weren't getting. And I used to take a group of people, we had a little wagon that people could ride on the back of, and we'd loop around the farm, and then there was a, a pretty steady climb back up to where the house and the barn was. And we'd be out for a nice little ride, and I'd come around to the bottom of the hill and start up. And about halfway, o halfway up the hill, I'd pull the horses off to the side and stop. And I'd say to the people in the wagon, why did I stop? And, you know, I'd get all kinds of answers. You know, I, I don't know. You, have, you wanted to tell us something. I don't know. Uh, people couldn't guess. And then I would say, listen. And they would listen, but they wouldn't hear anything. And then I would just move my hand with the breathing of the team. And all of a sudden, they'd hear <laughs> Because these two horses were pulling a bunch of people up a hill. And that is really hard. So uh, th they would get that. 
they would understand that I pulled over because the horses were winded. And here they were sitting in the wagon, da 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 da, and they didn't hear that the horses were winded. And even after we stopped, they didn't hear it. And I would explain to them that this is so true in our, the way we treat other people. So often we don't stop when we hear that s they're winded. We don't let them rest. We don't let them catch their breath. And we push and we push and we push. And again, anybody who knows horses knows, <clears throat> if you do that to a team of horses, they'll get bulky, meaning they'll protect themselves by not, not letting you put them in that situation. And that's what people do too. And then we blame the people just like we blame the horses. Oh, they're bulky. Well, yeah, <clears throat> they're smart. They figure out what they have to do to protect themselves. So over the years, um, we grew the farm and we grew a family of five kids. And uh, three of my children are uh, big strapping boys. Um, I will say uh, the two older ones make me look little. And when the oldest one, he's 24, comes home to visit, he picks me up over his head. <laughs> so I do not enjoy that. I'm like, put me down! Um, anyway, so they're big guys. They grew up on the farm. And my two daughters uh, were actually born with a, a condition called Otahara syndrome, which is a a truly catastrophic neurologic disability. So my daughters um, never have never been able to see, um, never been able to move or speak or sit up. Uh, and they live at an age, their, their age is like a one month old baby. And uh, we've had to take care of them around the clock uh, since they were born. Uh, and I've actually written a couple of books about this. I wrote a book called um, Learning from Hannah. It's the name of one of our daughters. And in the book, Hannah and her sister are wise old women. And they are characters, and in the book, they're teachers. And I've often wondered about Haley and Hannah and how I got to be so lucky that two such fine teachers would come and live with me. Pretty nice. And <clears throat> both of my girls are nearing the end of their lifespan and don't have too much longer to live. We don't know, but a few more years maybe. And then <clears throat> they will pass on. And I must say that a great deal of who I am and who I've become actually has been a gift from them to their dad. Uh, uh, they've taught me a lot about human frailty, about my frailty. So <clears throat> it's now about five years ago, the older boys were growing up and the farm, you know, uh, uh, if you know uh, people involved in farming, <clears throat> they're always thinking that if they can just buy the land next to them, it's going to be, it's all going to work out, you know? There's always, if you just had a little more land, then, you know, every, that'll solve everything. So <clears throat> in the place where we lived, uh, not like Ohio, farmland was very inexpensive. So uh, around $500 an acre, which I don't think you get. $500 an acre around here for land. But 
Anyway, so by the time we were done with the farm, 17 years later, uh, we had 400 acres. And we had teams of horses, and uh, the boys were getting older, and I had a hired man, and we had a sawmill, and it was really a lot. Uh, and it, I was also doing my work with medical practice and writing books and uh, trying to change aging. So one day, uh, it was a winter day, and the water in the barn froze, and the heifers got out, and it was snowing, and I happened to be in Baltimore to give a lecture, and my wife calls up, and you know, I married so far up, it's really hard to describe. Uh, my wife calls me on the phone and tells me, and I know she's gonna handle it, but at the end of the conversation, she's like, have you ever thought about selling the farm? And I just stopped where I was walking, and I said, yeah, I have. 17 years, blood, sweat, tears, raised the children, poured everything we had into the farm, and one day we decided it was time to change. So <clears throat> we um, called an auctioneer. He came, uh, w went around, you know, if you have, you have you know the auctioneers, they always have the nicest pickup trucks. I have noticed this. <laughs> you never see an auctioneer in a rusty pickup. Have you ever noticed that? I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know, that seems to, auctioneering seems to be better business than farming somehow. So anyway, he comes, we drive around the farm. He tells me what he thinks I'm gonna get at the auction. He's been doing it for 40 years. Uh, comes back a few months later, we auction the entire farm, lock, stock, barrel, six hours, and the price that came in was within $20,000 of what the auctioneer said it would be. Wow. So we moved to town. And uh, we moved and we bought this house on a street. And where we had lived on the farm, you couldn't see not only could you not see any neighbors, you couldn't see any lights from the farmhouse. And uh, we're on a street that has a sidewalk. And uh, the very first thing I discovered is that I had a huge amount of spare time. Like a, a huge amount of spare time. I, uh, where did this come from? Um, I had been used to doing all the stuff I did and helping take care of the farm along with the boys. And now that we, the boys were growing up and we sold the farm, what am I gonna do? So um, I got a hold of an old guitar and decided I was going to learn to play guitar. Now, what you have to understand is uh, I'm not a musical person and when I started learning to play guitar, I was 49, and I was unbelievably bad. I couldn't even tune it. So the first thing I did was go out and get a teacher. This is something I want to say about the greenhouse project that you're doing here in town. Um, it doesn't matter what level you're at, you always need a teacher. It doesn't matter if you have the best greenhouses in the world, you need a teacher. All of the best musicians have teachers because in one human lifetime, you can't learn it all, even with a teacher and without a teacher, pff, very tough. So uh, I started playing and I was astounded at how clumsy I was and how difficult this was. And I the thing I learned is that I was 49. I had built a career as a, as a 
famous guy about aging. I had gone to Harvard Medical School. I'd learned to drive horses. I'd written half a dozen books, blah, blah, blah. And yet, when I tried to play music, I was awful. And this is why a lot of people in midlife don't learn music, is because it's easier to stick with what you know and not look like a fool. And learning music made me look like a fool a lot. And I gradually got the idea, wait a minute, maybe I'm supposed to look like a fool. Maybe looking like a fool is exactly what I need right now. Maybe looking like a fool and trying to play music is going to teach me a little something about myself. And um, what I discovered or rediscovered is that while I didn't have much talent, I had a lot of perseverance and a very patient wife. So I started playing and I started studying. And uh, I got this idea after I'd been playing about six months. I know what I'll do. Uh, I'll buy Jude, my wife, uh, I'll buy Jude a mandolin for Christmas. So you have to sort of think about Christmas morning and there's uh, this package and she picks it up, you know, whatever, what's this? She opens it up and she's like, a mandolin! <laughs> It'd be like you, you, you know, somebody gives you a trumpet. You're like, a tuba. You know, thank you, thank you for this tuba. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> so, so she, because she's really fun, and uh, she starts playing uh, music and turns out to have a lot more talent than I do. And we start playing together. And uh, so we made a little band called Hot Coco. And I don't mind telling you that she's hot and I'm Coco. <laughs> so we got this little game going now in the house. Everybody plays. If Jude, for any reason at any time, goes, ah, oh, I'm hot. She has to say, from hot cocoa. So, we're always, so now she goes, I'm exceptionally warm. Because <laughs> she doesn't want to do it. So, uh, so we started playing together. And I, I just want to say one thing about marriage. Um, when we were on the farm, oh my God, you know, we had the farm and the kids, and that united us. And when we moved to town, I don't know what might have happened if we hadn't found a way to be together. So we uh, learned this song uh, called Over the Waterfall. And I just I really want to, so you get the idea, when we would play one measure together, we would like high five each other and go, <gasps> you know, wow, we did it. We played one measure. So, uh, and gradually we learned how to play the song and um, we started having fun. Now, the thing is, as I got going, I remembered that when I was a kid, I was that kid who the church choir director said, just move your lips. Uh, <laughs> we don't, re don't really need you to sing. Uh, just move your lips. Um, and uh, I, I, I always had lots of enthusiasm, but pitch was an issue. And also, I wasn't very musical, so timing was an issue. So if you can imagine my singing with lots of enthusiasm, no pitch, and no timing. Well, uh, I was downtown and uh, in the town we live in, and I see this sheet of paper that has, uh, a, the, you know, little tear-off things that they have? And the paper says, anyone can learn to sing. So I'm like, hey, I'm anyone. Maybe I can learn to sing. So, <laughs> so I, I, I tear it off. I call this woman. Turns out her name is uh, Marcy Lynn Solomon. And uh, she's in her late 60s. Uh, she's a voice coach. And for 20, 30 years, uh, she toured with uh, Tony Bennett and um, sang at the Copacabana and uh, 
sang all over the world, and uh, she's living in my town teaching voice. So we go to her piano, you can imagine, and she plays a note and says, sing this note. Um, I am ready. So I sing the note. And then she goes on the piano, bong, 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 bong. I was only five notes off. <laughs> so pitch wasn't like, oh, he's flat, he's sharp. Five notes off. And she's like looking at me like, Please don't come back. You know. <laughs> but I have this perseverance. So I went every week and I practiced. And I got a little better. And uh, as I was thinking about coming out to see you, um, it made me stop and wonder, why was I doing this? I could have just been a big shot guy going around doing big shot things that I was really good at. Why did I, what was I supposed to get out of learning to sing when I looked so bad and so incompetent? And the answer is, that's where the passion is. That's where the good stuff is. When you guys built those houses across the road, you're basically saying, I want to learn to sing. And it doesn't mean you weren't totally talented in a lot of other areas. Yeah, I know your story. I know you're awesome. I know it. But what you said when you built those houses was, you ripped off the little piece of paper and said, I'm anyone, I can learn to sing. And you did it. And I'm so proud of you. So proud. So I thought uh, I might play a song or two, uh, you, you know, and um, I'll do it uh, without apology, uh, but I'll also say to you, just in the short time I've been here, uh, I've seen like uh, in this room, uh, basically everyone's a better musician than I am. But I don't care because I love music. I wanted to play some. So I thought I'd play a, a little bit for you. Are you, you okay with that? So, this guitar uh, comes from 1972, and uh, the guy I got it from said that like a lot of guitars from 1972, it sat in a... Uh, case in the back of a closet for like 30 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> Somebody bought it in a fit of enthusiasm in 1972 and then it uh, didn't get played. What's nice now is that it uh, gets played uh, a lot and uh, I find that my uh, I get a lot of enjoyment uh, just by sitting and playing for myself. And one of the first things I had to do uh, was kind of learn the strings and learn basically how music was made. So I practiced and practiced. And the thing I want you to know is that my uh, uh, wife was somehow able to tolerate uh, me playing the same thing for hours and hours and hours. And you know, if I had been a kid who'd done this, I'd be labeled somehow, I'm sure, as having some serious problems.
so I, that was like three months of my life to play that little ditty. Anyone recognize the tune? Old American tune, Spike Driver's Blues. And it's really the story of John Henry. And it's the story of how a John Henry raced against the machine. You guys know this? You know this story, right? Raced against the machine. And he actually he defeated the steam uh, uh, spike driving machine. And as he drove in the last spike, his heart burst and he died. And uh, one reason why I picked this song and why I wanted to learn it and you know, to learn to play it was that in a lot of ways, that's my work in aging and long-term care. I'm up against this spike driving machine. A lot of long-term care, you guys don't realize as, as much because you live in a kind of loving, much more of a loving community. But a lot of people who live in nursing homes around America, they don't live in a loving community. They, they live in a machine. And that has to be changed. And it has to be made right. So John Henry was always an inspiration to me. I mean, I wasn't really uh, looking forward to dying of a burst heart. But his belief that the person could defeat the machine, that was always very attractive to me. So uh, another song uh, that uh, Jude and I play together, and you're only getting the cocoa experience, not the hot cocoa experience. She plays uh, mandolin with this with me, and I'm playing it alone for you. Uh, so to my ear, it doesn't sound as good as when we do it together. This is an old song called uh, Shady Grove. Some of you know this song. So uh, I like this song uh, because it uh, talks about a young person, a young man uh, who wants to find love and leaves home, goes seeking love, uh, finds love, and then disappointment. And so in his disappointment, the only thing he can think of is to go back home.
Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, my darling, Shady Grove, my little love, growing back to Harlan. So, uh, even though I'm uh, uh, an amateur, and even though uh, a lifetime of habit couldn't stop me uh, from thinking as I was playing, oh, I made a mistake, oh, I made a mistake. Um, I, I wanted to come out and, in a sense, uh, take this risk with you. And I wanted to take the chance of failure with you. And I wanted to put myself in a place where I was not the big dude expert from out of town, where I was the student and the, and the person who's struggling to master a craft. Because that's what I asked you, do, you to do for me. I asked you to leave what you know so well to, to stretch beyond what you're comfortable with, to try to explore things that are uh, skills and um, mm, risks that are new. And I just didn't think it would be fair uh, for me to come out and act like I knew what I was talking about. Because I'm on a journey of discovery. And um, I spend a lot of time not being competent at things. I, I spend a lot of time in my life just as, uh, trying to learn how to do new things. And uh, I'll tell you, um, I, um, about a year and a half ago, my phone rang and uh, a fellow had um, 